Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Nuclear Criticality Safety Lecture Series. The goal of criticality safety is to both prevent criticality accidents and to mitigate the consequences of any criticality accidents. Today we're going to discuss criticality accident alarm systems, or CAS systems, which allow us to accomplish the second half of our goal of mitigating the consequences of criticality accidents. CAS alarms mitigate the impact of accidents by detecting criticalities and prompting workers to evacuate. As we've discussed in the previous lecture, workers can dramatically increase their dose from an accident if they hang around and expose themselves to delayed fission neutrons, or if the system happens to experience a repeated prompt supercritical excursion. CAS alarms prevent these two possibilities by alerting workers right after the first critical excursion has occurred. The ANSI ANS 8.3 standard guides the design and use of CAS alarms, and to be effective, CAS alarms must be able to identify any credible critical excursions. The smallest criticality event yield is about 10 to the 15th fissions, and the initial spike yield from a criticality accident will generally produce less than 10 to the 18th fissions. The maximum probable yield from a criticality accident is also in the range of 10 to the 18th fissions, and the maximum credible yield from a single supercritical excursion is around 2 times 10 to the 19th fissions. CAS detectors generally rely on detecting fission gamma rays, but they could also function by detecting fission neutrons. We generally want CAS detectors to be as simple as possible so that they are also as reliable as possible, and CAS detectors that rely on detecting neutrons are generally more complex, less reliable, and more expensive. Large sodium iodine gamma detectors are pretty efficient, pretty reliable, and pretty cheap. Japanese scientists have designed neutron-based CAS detectors that detect neutrons indirectly by looking for the gamma rays that are released by neutron capture reactions and these kinds of neutron-based CAS detectors could theoretically be necessary for very heavily shielded systems that do not allow a significant amount of gamma rays from fission events to reach the CAS detectors. But no matter what detector design we choose for our CAS detectors, they must be able to detect a supercritical excursion. If our operations take place in a very large room, or if it's credible that a large object might be placed between the CAS detectors and a potential accident location, then we may have to use multiple CAS detector arrays in that room. In fact, any potential accident locations must be covered by at least three CAS detectors. This is because CAS systems generally decide to sound an alarm using a two-thirds majority voting logic. In fact, if you look closely at this picture of a real-life CAS detector, you'll notice that it contains three separate radiation detectors. If only one detector sees a radiation spike, then it's possible that that detector could be malfunctioning, and we don't want one malfunctioning detector to send the operations grinding to a halt. Aside from the economic impact of halting operations for a faulty CAS alarm, stopping operations quickly for an evacuation can actually be very dangerous. Not only are workers handling fissile materials, but they may also be handling volatile chemical compounds. Workers are going to want to evacuate as quickly as humanly possible when the CAS alarms sound, and a worker could easily violate an administrative limit or spill a dangerous chemical during the rush to evacuate. Therefore, requiring at least two out of three of the CAS detectors to agree that a dangerous condition exists will reduce the likelihood of erroneous evacuations. So again, our goals and performance requirements for CAS detectors include that the detectors should not trip erroneously. In fact, we should experience a false alarm less than once every 10 years. And we should also make sure that any background radiation or radiation from routine, normal physical material operations does not trip the CAS alarms. We also want to make sure that the CAS alarms function properly when a dangerous condition does exist. Therefore, the CAS detectors should each have a low failure rate per demand. Typically, we want less than a 1% chance of failure per demand. If each CAS detector array uses three detectors with the two-thirds majority voting logic, then this means that there's less than a 10 to the negative 4 chance that this detector array will fail to detect a supercritical excursion. We also want to make sure that our CAS detectors don't suffer damage during a criticality accident. 
Not only might damage or a phenomenon such as buildup make our detectors unable to detect a supercritical excursion, but a detector that breaks after one supercritical excursion will be unable to detect repeated excursions. Next, the CAS detector should not be closer to the potential accident locations than is necessary, which both keeps them from getting in the way during operations and allows each detector array to maximize its coverage of potential accident locations. Lastly, the CAS detector should be easy to service and to maintain. Just like any active control mechanism, we'll need to perform regular maintenance and routine testing on CAS detectors to both ensure that the CAS detector, which is the active control sensor, is functioning properly, and also that the CAS alarms, the active control's actuator, are alarming properly and are audible throughout the facility. CAS alarms are generally considered to be a helpful safety mechanism during physical material operations, and during the 1958 Y-12 criticality accident, CAS alarms saved the life of at least one operator. The Y-12 National Security Complex in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, which is just outside of Knoxville, Tennessee, has historically enriched uranium and to this day fabricates HEU into different components. The Y-12 1958 criticality accident took place in the C wing of Y-12, where HEU scrap was dissolved in nitric acid and then purified and concentrated to recover the scrap uranium. In the days preceding the accident, the entire facility was shut down for a fissile material inventory, where the facility was cleaned to ensure that no uranium holdup was hiding somewhere. Also during this inventory, all of the tanks in the operation were disassembled and leak tested. Due to the size of the facility, this inventory process took several days, and on the day of the accident, operations had been resumed in the B wing while the C wing was still undergoing its inventory. The C wing inventory involved cleaning, disassembling, and leak testing tanks FSTK 1 2, 6 1, and 6 2, which were all used to store urinal nitrate solution. At 1 a.m. on Monday, June 16th, the C wing shift supervisor noted that yellow urinal nitrate solution was present in the glass standpipe that was part of the C wing pH adjustment station. The supervisor instructed the operator to drain this excess solution into a geometrically unfavorable 55 gallon, 208 liter, drum. At 5 a.m., the supervisor once again noted that urinal nitrate was present in the standpipe, and the team determined that the urinal nitrate solution must have been leaking in from valve V2 in the pH adjustment station. The operators closed this valve, drained the remaining solution into the 55 gallon drum once again, and continued their work. What the operators didn't know was that the urinal nitrate solution was actually leaking into C wing from the B wing, where operations had resumed. The urinal nitrate was leaking through valve V1, which was partially open. At 7 a.m., there was a shift change in the facility, and it appears that the previous supervisor failed to inform the next supervisor about the urinal nitrate that had been leaking into the standpipes. Accounts differ on whether the supervisor actually informed the next supervisor, but we do know for sure that the leaks were not recorded in the operations logbook. At 8 a.m., the new supervisor began operations to leak check the FSTK vessels 61, 62, and 1-2, which all had been cleaned during the previous week. This leak check simply involved filling the vessels with water and then draining that water into the 55-gallon drum. This shift's supervisor was concerned that urinal nitrate could be leaking into C-wing from the operating B-wing, and so he had an operator check that the V-1 valve was closed. The operator applied force to the valve, which actually closed it completely and halted the inflow of urinal nitrate solution from the B-wing. The V1 valve was actually located in a pretty difficult to reach location, which could explain why operators during the previous shift did not check that the valve was closed. Even though the V1 valve was now closed, the operators were not aware of how much urinal nitrate had flowed into the C wing, and they also didn't know that the V3 valve on tank FSTK 1 2 had been left open, thereby allowing the tank to fill with the urinal nitrate solution from the B wing. The operators continued their work and began leak testing the FSTK 6-1 and 6-2 tanks, after which they opened valves V4, 
V5 and V11 to drain the water from these tanks into the 55 gallon drum. The flow pattern for these tanks caused all the liquid from tank FSTK12, which they mistakenly thought was empty, to flow into the 55 gallon drum first, followed by the water from the 61 and 62 tanks. One of the operators, who we'll call Operator A, stood by the 55 gallon drum as they drained the tanks. This operator's job was to monitor for any abnormal conditions, and as they started draining the tanks, the operator noticed yellow brown fumes rising from the liquid. The operator took a step back from the drum, a move that most likely saved his life, and a few seconds later saw a blue flash. The building's CAS alarm sounded after the blue flash, and the workers promptly evacuated the facility. Solution in the 55 gallon drum was actually under moderated when the supercritical excursion began, and the water that was draining into the drum from the 61 and 62 tanks continued to add reactivity for the next 11 minutes, after which the solution began to be over moderated and gradually lose reactivity until it became subcritical. The water from these tanks continued to fill the drum, and after 20 minutes, the solution became subcritical and the supercritical excursions ended. Other than Operator A, who was standing next to the drum, there were six other operators in the building at the time of the accident. Operators B, C, D, and E were standing a short distance away from the 55-gallon drum in front of a series of large tanks, and Operators F and G were stationed on the other side of these tanks. The operators received doses of 461 rem, 428 rem, 413 rem, 341 rem, 298 rem, and 86.5 rem. Several of the operators fell ill due to acute radiation syndrome, but they all actually survived the instant. Had operator A not backed away from the drum right before the prompt supercritical excursion, or had the CAS alarms not sounded and prompted the other workers to evacuate, then it's very likely that several of the operators would not have survived this accident. It is, however, worth noting that the evacuation path for this accident actually caused a significant increase in the dose received by operators B, C, D, and E. Operator A's evacuation route took him directly away from the 55-gallon drum, while operator B, C, D, and E's routes actually took them closer to the drum. This is why they received nearly the same dose as operator A, who was right next to the drum when the accident started. This shows the importance of well-planned evacuation routes, which are sometimes quite difficult to plan because we don't usually know where a criticality accident is likely to take place or has taken place until well after the accident has ended. Following the accident, the Y-12 complex shut down for three days before resuming physical material operations. The accident caused no significant contamination or damage, but it is worth comparing this accident to the Tokomura accident, where a somewhat similar solution accident caused an entire district to shelter in place and halted all produce and milk production in the entire area surrounding the accident site. Safety standards and safety culture truly were very different in the 1950s compared to the 1990s. This concludes our lecture on CAS alarms and on the Y-12 1958 criticality accident. In the next lecture, we'll discuss how having a healthy safety culture can help a facility to avoid criticality accidents.